Let the river refresh our hearts, Lord God. Come now, fount of every blessing to my heart to sing thy praise. Streams of mercy never ceasing. Awful songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious song and sung by praying tongues above. Praise the mountain fixed upon it, Mount of Thy redeeming love. Good morning, everybody. Glad to see some in the in-house this morning. I hope you're tuned in virtually if you couldn't be here this morning. Uh, what a great day. So far, it's been a good day. It's not too hot yet. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I'm glad you're here this morning. Really am. Uh, announcements for this week. Uh, tonight at 6 o'clock on the district Facebook page is the district worship. Tune in, I'm sure you'll get a blessing from it. Uh, it's PGH NAS at Facebook, I believe. Yep, something like that. You can find it, you'll search it and find it. Sunday school at 7.30 ish, because you know, we'll uh, do that virtually after the, after the tr district church meeting. Uh, the Hughes family celebration is next Saturday, uh, 10 o'clock at the cemetery, Pinewood in Cranberry there, and at 4 o'clock at Tracy's brother's house. So if you need directions, get a hold of Tracy. Uh, let's shot and support them. Uh, it's been a tough, tough couple of years, year and a half-ish for the Hughes family, losing Bill and Mary. Uh, let's show up and support. Glad to see some of you made it out to Josh's graduation party last night. It was or Friday night, not last night, Friday night. It was wonderful to see some of you in person, and it was great to be out and around people. It was wonderful and good food and everything. Thank you, Woolertons, for hosting that. Uh, prayer meetings are going to resume here in the church. Yay! Not this Friday, but on August 5th, we'll be here at 7.30. 7.30, Cindy's nodding her head. I got that one right. Wednesday. Wednesday. I said that. I said Friday, did I? One of the days it ends with a Y. Uh, <laughs> Wednesday the 5th, we'll be back here. We'll socially distance and, and we'll take precautions, but we will uh, we'll get, uh, get some good prayer meetings back together so we can get some more uh, community time with each other. So, with all that said, uh, what are your praises and prayer requests this morning? What do you got? What's God doing in your lives? Doug. All right. Twenty nine years. Twenty nine years with Doug. Let's see. When do we canonize wives? It's <laughs> twenty nine years. Congratulations, you guys. That's a wonderful accomplishment today. Any other praises or prayer requests this morning? Amen. It's a great thing. For hope and faithfulness. 
Uh, absolutely. Good to have the Roy family with us this morning. Nice to see you visiting. I saw another hand. Where did I see that hand? Jack. Absolutely. <laughs> it fell the right way. <laughs> Good. You know, it sounds like something silly to praise the Lord for, but it's not. We praise Him for everything. Brian. Good for him. <laughs> so, one more week of that, and he'll be certainly glad when it's over. So, just keep him in prayer. Also, hey, pray. If there is docking site, then you pray. Exactly. So, exactly. Absolutely. Ethan and all those that are still unemployed from for months, uh, if you're if you're not essential, you know, and if you are essential, we thank you for your service. We have a long list of people that are essential that work that come to church here, and thank you, thank you, thank you. We can't say enough. Any others this morning? Oh, absolutely. For everyone that's not here, uh, you know, can't wait for the day where we can all be back together again. Jack, again. Absolutely. Absolutely. Unspoken requests this morning. All over the house, yeah, absolutely. Probably many out there in the video TV land. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, we thank you for this day we can gather in your house. We might be small and few in number, but Lord, our hearts are here and we're ready to receive your word this morning. Lord, we come to you with, with praises on our lips, especially for 29 years of marriage. Lord, we thank you for Doug and Karen and their example, and we give them many, many more years together. Uh, for, for Lord, we're so thankful that you give us hope and you give us faithfulness back, Lord. Thank you for always being there for us, for being there whenever we need you, whenever we call on you. And Lord, we thank you for the small things in life that we overlook a lot of times, Father, for limbs that don't fall on our houses, for things that don't get destroyed when, when nature happens, Father. We thank you for that hedge of protection that is around us. Father, for those that aren't here this morning, we ask you to put continued blessings upon them, give them healing touches, give them compassion, give them whatever they need, Lord. You know every need, every, every concern, every, every deep thought in their minds, Lord. Minister to them this day and whatever they need, Lord. Be with, continue to be with Ethan as he's going through this tick bite and the job search. Help him to find the job quickly. The, the CMU sounds promising, Father. We hope that you have a hand in that and that's where you would like to have him, Father. For the schools and the students going back to school and for, for the administrations and for the parents and for everyone involved in schools making difficult decisions whether to go back to school or to have virtual school or to have half and half, Father. Father, put a hedge of protection around all of them, Lord. Those that go to school, those that work at the schools. Give us clarity of mind as to what would be the best course of action in all of these things, Father. For our church friends, Lord, that are in need of medical attention, Father, for Jack's friends, for our country, Father, we thank you we live in a place where we can gather freely and unafraid in the mornings on Sundays and pray to you without fear of reprisal, Father. We ask you to be with our military personnel or here at home and around the world, Father. Keep them safe, get them home safely to their families and their friends and get them home swiftly, Father. And all of the unspoken requests, Lord, signified by upraised hands here in the sanctuary and those at home watching, Lord, whatever their needs. Father, we continue to ask your blessings upon this church. And it is all these things we ask in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Amen. A call, short call to worship this morning. 
very familiar. Uh, just to get your mind working before we jump right into the message. It comes from Isaiah 40. Many people have this on plaques, on their walls, in their homes, but it's so true. Those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. And that's all due to the Lord's love in our lives. In case you've missed it the last couple of weeks, we've been in a study in Job. Uh, some on-the-job training, if you would. Uh, I always think of things after the fact I said last week. We've been looking at the various trials that Job has been going through and the various things that happened in his life. Most of us, when we read through the book of Job or even just start the book of Job, we say a silent prayer to ourselves and to God that those things would not happen to us. Inflicted with the loss of his wealth and his possessions, and while trying to regroup from completely losing his family, Job has friends. And, but soon, before his friends arrive, he's inflicted with boils all over his body from head to toe. His wife is really no help. She doesn't understand that what is happening and wants her husband to just simply curse God and die. We've seen a long list of questions answered because of what has happened to Job. Why do bad things happen to good people? Because we live in a fallen world. Because we have a choice. The Lord gave us free will. Because some people do some pretty bad things to each other. I'm sorry, that's where we live. And then we see from the conversation that God and Satan keep having concerning Job, that, that God sometimes allows things to happen so that we can learn from them, so that we can grow. More importantly, so God's glory can be reflected by our actions. Are we foolish, we asked last week? Are we foolish to believe, like Job's wife, that we could curse God and not see consequences in our life? Are we foolish to, to listen to bad advice of some people that, that move us away from God instead of toward God? Last week, again, we looked at Job and his dealing with that, that depression, that disappointment, that sheer loss in his life. He's one hurting man with a lot of issues, Job is. His heart is laid wide open because of what's happening in his life. Job is yelling at God. And I'll tell you a secret this morning, it's okay. He can take it. He's crying out to God. And that's okay because God will listen. He's looking for some comfort from God and from his three closest friends. So that brings us this morning to the fourth chapter of Job. We get to hear a response to Job's troubles. Chapter 4 of the book of Job in your Bibles. Then Eliphaz the Temanite replied, If someone ventures a word with you, you, will you be impatient? But who can keep from speaking? Think how you have instructed many, how you have strengthened feeble hands. Your words have supported those who stumbled. You have strengthened faltering knees. But now troubles come to you, and you are discouraged. It strikes you, and you are dismayed. Should not your piety be your confidence, and your blameless ways your hope? Consider now who, being innocent, has ever perished. Were there, where were the upright ever destroyed? As I have observed, those who plow evil and those who sow trouble reap it. At the breath of God they perish. At the blast of his anger they are no more. The lions may roar and growl, yet the teeth of the great lions are broken. The lion perishes for lack of play. Pray, and the cubs of the lioness are scattered. A word was secretly brought to me. My ears caught a whisper of it. Amid disquieting dreams in the night, when people sleep 
When deep sleep falls on people, fear and trembling seized me and made all my bones shake. A spirit glided past my face and the hair on my body stood on end. It stopped, but I could not tell what it was. A form stood before my eyes and I heard a hushed voice. Can a mortal be more righteous than God? Can even a strong man be more pure than his maker? If God places no trust in his servants, if he charges his angels with error, how much more those who live in houses of clay, whose foundations are in the dust, who are crushed more readily than a moth. Between dawn and dusk they are broken to pieces. Unnoticed they perish forever. Are not the cords of their tent pulled up so that they die without wisdom. Eliphaz. He sounds like a really great friend, doesn't he? Pointing all this out to Job. So what if we were to highlight or to outline the book of Job? We would learn that, that the first three chapters were God's test of Job, of his faithfulness, though Satan attacking him every aspect of his life just short of killing him. He had no idea that God was allowing this because he couldn't see, again, the big picture like God does. Chapters 4 through 37, that's a big part, is a dialogue with his three friends, giving him advice of what he ought to do since God obviously has forsaken him and is now punishing him. All that in air quotes. Chapter 38 till the end of Job, Almighty God begins restoration to Job's life. Pretty simple outline of the book of Job. But let's go back to today's reading in chapter 4. Eliphaz, this great friend of Job, that remember at the end of chapter 1, he shows up and he sits for Seven days, chapter 2, he sits at the end for seven days with Job and his two friends, and they just sit there and don't say a word to him. Anybody got a friend that never talks? I didn't think so. But Eliphaz, he believes that all that's happening to Job, the loss of everything, his family, his, his sheep, his servants, everything, his wealth is gone now. He believes that everything is happening because Job has some sort of sin that's going on in his life. That's Eliphaz's take on it. Job is suffering because he's not listening to God and he's not obeying God. When he begins listening, all this turmoil will stop. In verse 12 of chapter 4, Eliphaz says to Job that God himself woke him up in a dream and told him about what was happening to Job. He says that while everybody else was sleeping and dreaming, Job, God woke me up to talk to me about you. He says, while I was in that deep REM sleep, I came straight up out of bed and I was no longer relaxed because I received a message from God about you. I couldn't make out the face, but this is what he said to me. Can a mortal be more righteous than God? Can, can even a strong man be more pure than the maker? Let those questions settle in for a minute this morning. Don't you just not like it when a conversation with a close friend starts out with, I don't want to get into your business, but... Because that always ends up being in your business. I don't want to gossip, but I just have to tell you about this. Do you know what I just heard about? These are all different ways to start the same conversation. And especially when they end the conversation, you didn't hear it from me. If we sneak a peek into Job 5, verse 8, we get that time-honored advice from a friend. You know, that if I were you advice that friends give you all the time. Well, it's a good thing you're not me because that would just mess it up even more. Eliphaz says to Job in chapter 5, If I were you, I would appeal to God. I would lay my cause before him. 
Job, this trouble that you're experiencing, everything you're going through in your life that has come on you is because of some sin in your life. Great, Eliphaz. Thanks for that spot-on Captain Obvious report. The calamities you face are because you are in some kind of rebellion to God. That's the nasty old, old secret sin that's in your life. He tells Job just how he can fix it. Now, in your life, there's usually two kinds of friends. Those that can see everything wrong with your life and those that know exactly how you can fix what's wrong with your life. It's easy, Job. This is all you have to do. You fear God and you come back to faith in Him. Yeah. Yeah. You're not as blameless as you pretend to be, Job. There is sin in you somewhere. Again, what a great friend. What a guy to point this out. Job was a super saint to his friends. He was a wealthy businessman. But, but as soon as trouble hits him, these friends... Friends, we'll say again, saw him under the hand of God's correction. So they felt that it was all Job's fault. Now remember when we met Job at the very beginning of the book, he was a righteous man. He feared the Lord. But all of this was because of something in Job, and it was his fault somewhere he abandoned his faith and his walk with God. He tells him, whether you did before the crisis began, whatever you were doing before all this bad stuff happened in your life, whatever you were doing when things were going great for you, that's what you need to go back and do again. You need to, you need to reestablish your confidence, Job, back to what it was and what it's not now. Eliphaz is probing Job. He's, he's asking some very hard questions. At one time, Job, you trusted God. Now here's the question that we can all ask ourselves this morning. At one time, you trusted God completely. Why did you stop? Don't turn back to your former ways. Eliphaz is saying, stay the course. He's saying, and he's treating him like a backslidden believer. Eliphaz offers his advice. Get back to the basics, Job. This must be your fault. If you read through commentators or commentaries about different books of the Bible, they're very divided over the tone of Eliphaz in chapter 4 and 5. Some think that he's a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a sympathetic encourager. I see a person in, who was in judgment of him and didn't have all the facts to be advising Job on, on what to do anyway. He didn't have the whole big picture, so what gives him the right to tell Job what to do next? Anybody out there got friends like that? Shh, keep them down, keep them down. I really think that, that Eliphaz was one of those, I don't want to get it into your business, peoples. But he did. Not, I'm not saying that he did. He did get into to Job's business. He was one of those, I got to see what I can do to help. I have to help people. On the surface, <clears throat> Eliphaz's advice seems very reasonable. Job certainly needed to trust in God. He, he, was, he was to practice a moral lifestyle as he had before. Where he went extremely out of character about God was that God always rewards the righteous. 
The problem with that reasoning is that it fails to take into account what, we really, what was really happening in Job's life. Because he could not see the whole picture. Eliphaz believed in divine retribution, if you will. If anything bad happens to you, if anything wrong happens in your life, if anything not quite right occurs in your life, it must be, it has to be, there's no other explanation for it that there is sin in your life. Every bad choice brings God's wrath and every good choice brings God's rewards. You see the problem with that? These are, these are half-truths because God does say that He will reap what we sow. But it's His righteous judgment on what He does in each situation. The Bible tells us in Matthew 4 that He makes His sun rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the just and the unjust. That doesn't sound like He's playing favorites there. Because God gets to make those choices. I do believe if we're not rewarded in this world, that we will be rewarded later. But again, it's God's choice on how the reward will manifest. Here's the main, the main thing of this morning. The thing that we're going to work through for the remainder of the time. In the middle of suffering, we must not lose our hope in God. Let me say that again. In the middle of our suffering, we must not, must not lose our hope in God. In the middle of all the junk, in the middle of all the garbage, in the middle of the darkness, in the middle which the world throws at us, all the evil that comes at us from every side, don't let that stuff change your focus. If you're taking notes, it's because we do not see the big picture. We cannot see the whole picture of what God is doing or not doing in someone's life. Therefore, because we can't see that, we, we need to be careful that we don't give advice that is not only godly, but could be destroying a person's life. We don't want to give advice that's not godly. We don't know all the facts. Because we don't need to. We do not know what has brought that person to where they are. We do not know what God is doing in the times that they're going through. The illustration is, is, is a few years ago there was a TV ad that, that started like this. There's a woman sitting in a car, she's minding her own business, and suddenly this man comes out of the blue, rips the door open, grabs her and pulls her out of the car roughly and violently. It looks like he's attacking her. And we look on this commercial in horror, like, why are they showing this on TV? But then as the camera pans back, we're able to see that the car behind her is actually on fire. And she didn't know it. The man wasn't assaulting the woman. He was trying to rescue her. And the ad finishes by saying, you need the bigger picture. And it was for a news channel. Regular local TV news channel. We need the bigger picture. The faithfulness of God is true and has been proven many, many times. As Karen said this morning, we have hope and faithfulness. God cannot lie, nor can He break any unconditional promise that He has said that He will fulfill. Every covenant that God has made, He has kept. Every promise or foretelling has come true. 
when we're going through the ordeal of being unfairly attacked, when we're being lied about, when our reputation is being drugged through the mud, through the mire, when we're being publicly smeared, when our friends betray us, when a spouse abandons us, it may appear impossible that any of these things could accomplish anything good, but I tell you, they do. Because the key word there is, they appear. They appear to happen. We see far, far less than what God sees. He sees, we see, a, the good that may come from the treachery of others is not planned by the, plan, by the hand of man. It is, not, it is not seen in advance. Only God can fully satisfy the hungry heart of man. I, I don't care if you've got millions of dollars. I don't care if you have every car you've ever wanted in your life. I don't care if, if you have the most successful job with the least amount of work that you can possibly do. Only God can satisfy the hungry heart of man. Nothing else. Many times we, we mistakenly compare God's faithfulness to our own. Our faithfulness is sometimes on, it's sometimes off maybe. However, God's faithfulness, it's never off to begin with. It's always on. It never ends. It's un, uncomparable. It's far beyond what we could ever succeed on our own. If there's a measure of faithfulness accredited to us, if there is a meter to measure our faithfulness, it's all because of His face faithfulness that gives us the strength to do what we're going through. Not a thing we do. Nothing of God dies when a man of God dies. We die, but the promise of God lives on. They bury us. They put our bodies into the ground, but they don't bury God's promise from within us. Your death cannot nullify God's faithfulness. Our God is the God of the future. Isn't that great? He's already got today taken care of. Don't, don't worry about today. Tomorrow has enough worries of its own. Don't worry about tomorrow either. God has this. He's the God of generations to come. So when we're gone, there's people behind us that are going to have the same God. The same God is going to take care of them. And then the next generation, and the next, and the next. God is so faithful that anyone, anyone who seeks Him can find Him. Isn't that great? Faith is a gift, but even a gift must be opened to be enjoyed. Open your faith this morning. As, as we implement our faith, as we open it, we begin to realize more and more about God's faithfulness to us. And then we open another gift of faith, and it reveals more faithfulness to us. And then we open another gift of faith, and it shows more. You see how this doesn't end? You see how great God is? God cannot act out of character with His essential nature. Let me say that again. God cannot act out of character with His essential nature. None of God's attributes can ever contradict another attribute. Nothing God does contradicts anything He's already done, or is doing, or will do. Every aspect of God works in complete harmony together. 
Since, since he is perfect and unchangeable, he can never cease to be what he is. And I said is, not was, not will be, what he is because he always is. Everything that God has done or everything that he will do is consistent with all that he is. Everything that, that God does will always agree with all that God is. God is love. Paul says in Philippians 1.12, I want you to know, my dear brothers and sisters, that everything that has happened to me here has helped to spread the good news. And Paul's another one of those that he's the Job of the New Testament. The things that happened to him, many people would have just given up way early in their careers. If, if you want to be a joyful person, you need to look at every problem from God's viewpoint. Joyful people have a larger perspective on life, don't they? They can see not quite the whole big picture, but they see a bigger picture than we do. When, when you don't see things from God's point of view, you get that, that discouragement, that frustration, that unhappiness, that, uh, why me look? Ever since Paul came, became a Christian on that road to Damascus, he had dreamed of one great dream. He had one goal. He wanted to preach in Rome, the center of the universe, the center of the world at that time, the most civilized and cultural city on the face of the earth in Paul's day. His dream was to preach the gospel in the most important city in the world. God had other ideas. Instead of letting Paul go to Rome to preach crusades and camp meetings and revivals, God made him a royal prisoner of Caesar, who at that time was Nero. Nero was about as wicked and as bad and as evil of a person, as a leader, as a ruler could ever be. As a royal prisoner, Paul is chained to a royal guard 24 hours a day for two years. We've been in quarantine for four months. And we're all just a little, I got to get out of this place, stir crazy has set in. Paul was chained to another person for two years. In two years of prison, imprisonment, how many people did he witness to? The guard was changed every few hours. Some reports say every four hours the guard changed. So if you do the math and there were no repeats because Rome had a huge army at the time, that would have meant that he witnessed to 4,380 different guards. You can't get away when you're chained to the guy telling you about Jesus. You can't get away, so you have to listen. Who was the real prisoner here? Who, who had the captive audience, if you will, in this situation? This wasn't Paul's plan. This was not his goal in life, to spend life in prison chained to another man every four hours, another new man. But it was God's doing all along. Philippians 4 says that within two years, some of Nero's own family had become believers because of Paul's witness in the royal court in Rome. Family members of one of the most corrupt rulers history will ever know were converted to Christ. Anytime you have a problem that's starting to get you down, you need, we need to do exactly what Paul did. We have to learn to look at our problems from God's point of view. Ask, ask questions like, is it okay 
It is. It's okay to ask God questions. Ask, what is God doing here? Ask, what's the bigger picture? Ask, what's the bigger perspective? And you're going to be able to face these problems in faith. You'll be able to, you'll be able to tell your friends that they might fail, but God never fails. Friends may fail you. God never fails. In Joshua 21.45, Not all of the Lord's good promises to Israel failed. Everyone was fulfilled. God never fails. Isaiah 55.11, So is my word that goes out of my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose of which I sent it. God's word is trustworthy. His promises are true. What God says he will do, he's going to do. 2 Corinthians 1.20 For all the promises of God in Him are yes, and in Him, amen, to the glory of God through us. This is why we say amen. It means so be it. It means ditto. It means likewise. Whatever language you want to say it, we hear the truth. Amen. How many of you have ever been led astray by poor advice. <laughs> how, how many have lost their focus on God and stared blankly at their circumstances? You, you know what I'm talking about, that kind of that teenager stare that just, huh? You just can't wrap your head around what's going on. You can't comprehend what you need to even to fix it. If we fast forward to Job chapter 9, Job is speaking with his other friend. Another great friend, Bildad. And he says, Nor is there any mediator between us who may lay his hands on us both. Let him take his rod away from me and do not let dread of him terrify me. Then I would speak and not fear him, but it is not so with me. Some may see where I'm going to go with this. In Job's time, with these three great friends of his, his wife giving him advice too, there was no mediator. Bless you. But on this side of the cross, on the, on the AD side of the cross, on the Jesus side of the cross, what do we got? We have a mediator, and his name is Jesus. It begins with a head bowed and a heart opened. It, it, it's, it begins by asking him to search our hearts and reveal himself to us. It begins in that summer camp meeting so long ago. It begins at a teen rally where your heart is convicted. It begins when you're an 80-year-old veteran looking for answers. It begins at any time. Job didn't know Jesus. But we do, or at least we can. You've heard the word of God that tells us that Jesus will not leave us or forsake us. And that's a great promise. And it tells us that he will take us through it. And he will be there to see us through. Again, this morning, Job brings us right back to relationship and trust. As a spoiler for next week, we're going to see how God begins to restore Job's life and turns some dramatic corners in his life. 
Let's stand as we go to prayer. Father, again, we thank you for your faithfulness this morning. We thank you for the words of Job that we can learn that how we can deal with looking at problems from your point of view, Father. Give us eyes that would see through yours, Father. Show us the things in life that we can change, and Lord, help us to recognize those things in life that we can help with. Lord, give us godly wisdom on our lips and advice that we can offer to others that have been through things that we've gone through. Lord, we return all glory, all honor, and all praise to you. In Jesus' precious holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. seems so far away a million miles or more it feels today and though I haven't lost my faith I must confess right now that it's hard for me to pray but I don't know what to say I don't know where to start But as you give the grace With all that's in my heart I will sing yes I will pray Even in my darkest time Through the sorrow and the pain I will sing Your word is true, I will sing. Lord, it's hard for me to see all the thoughts and plans you have for me. Yes, it is. But I will put my trust in you, knowing that you died. Set me free. Oh, thank God you did. But I don't know what to say. What to say. And I don't know where to, where to start. But as you give the grace. 